Can we start? Yes, sir. Now we, we have a start. patient who is having uh, like uh, ceasing act, ceasing activity. Now he is twenty five year old. He is a diabetic. Can we manage this patient? Yes, sir. Uh, so as the patient is actively ceasing, we'll first start with midazolam nasal spray. Please give one or two puffs. Midazolam nasal spray. Give it. What to do now? We are hoping that the seizure activity subsides. Okay. Once the seizure activity slowly starts subsiding, we'll put the patient in the recovery left, position, left, which is position. left lateral. Okay. So we have put the patient on left lateral position. What is the next step you Sir, want? Sir, what about the airway and breathing? Airway breathing is maintained, but lot of secretions are there. So uh, oral suction for removing the secretions. Suction we need the clear airway. Okay. So we'll do suction. After okay. that has been done to avoid cerebral hypoxia, we'll start. We'll connect the patient on nasal prongs nasal and prongs. deliver oxygen. Okay. So we have connected to uh, oxygen. How much oxygen you want to start? Sir, five liters. Five liters. We have started. Sir, as the patient has stopped seizing, now we can secure two IV lines. Okay. The patient is diabetic, right? He is a diabetic patient. Okay. Ha did he take uh, insulin? He is on insulin, but uh, last two three days he is having high degree fever, and uh, now he has come with seizure. Okay, uh, that is a clinical scenario. Okay, sir. So what about IV lines? Secured? IV yeah. lines secured. Two large bore IV lines secured. Okay, sir. So uh, as he has stopped seizing, now the first IV line we'll give force phenytoin, twenty mg per uh, kilogram. Okay. Over thirty minutes. So you in give, normal uh, saline. In normal saline, you start uh, one gram force phenytoin and. Uh, 20 mg per kg is somewhere around uh, 1 gram. We can start that. Over 30 minutes, you have to continue it. Sir, uh, what about the GRBS of the patient? We will check it. Please see it. It is 600. The patient is having hyperglycemia. Yes. Uh, can we also check the electrolytes and the VBG also? We will take an VBG. As the patient is having hyperglycemia, we'll start uh, phenytoin with uh, first normal saline, first phenytoin over normal saline over 30 minutes. Okay. And vitals? Vitals are stable at present. Okay. There is no hypo, uh, hypotension. Heart rate is slightly okay. higher. It is 110 beats per minute. BP is uh, 100 by 80. Okay. There is a slight hypotension here yes. and clearly he'll be having dehydration also. Okay. Are there any signs of dehydration? Currently, we are not able to check it because uh, he is having seizure and a lot of secretions are there. But there is no evident sign of dehydration, only hypotension is there. So anyways, with the, on the second IV line, we will uh, start fluid, fluid replacement we will give. Okay. So we are starting 1 litre of normal saline over 60 minutes. Okay. So meanwhile, the VBG has come, pH is only 6.9. Okay, uh, sir. Ketone bodies are positive okay. in this patient. Okay, IV sir. fluids are started. You have to tell what rate you have to give the IV fluid. So 1 litre over... Uh, so. As the BP is 100, it's not less than 90, yes. we'll give a slow infusion, 1 litre of normal saline over 60 minutes, the next 60 minutes. You can start normal saline over uh, 1 hour. Started. Okay, it started. Sir, so as the patient's clinical picture is showcasing towards more of a diabetic ketoacidosis mm. and the hyperglycemia is what caused the seizure. Okay. So, first we'll correct uh, the fluid. That okay. is one of the biggest problems that we face in DK. Okay. So, we have already started correct, uh, correcting the fluid levels. Okay. Now, we'll start uh, correcting the ketones and the hyperglycemia. Okay. For that, we'll start insulin infusion. Okay, start insulin infusion. The insulin infusion, we'll start uh, 10 units rapid because the uh, sugar is very high. Okay. 100. Uh, the sugar is 600. Right? Okay. And what about the ketones, sir? Ketones are positive. Ketone bodies are positive. pH is uh, 6.9. And sir, potassium? Potassium is 3. So, uh, we'll start the insulin infusion. Mm. After that, so now the first liter of normal saline is going. Okay. The next start, as the uh, potassium level is only 3, we are afraid that the potassium level might fall even more okay. because we are giving insulin infusion. Okay. So to avoid that, the next one liter of normal saline, mix it with potassium chloride. Okay. 40 millimoles of potassium, 40 millimoles per liter of potassium chloride okay. with normal saline. So you can add potassium to the existing fluid and give, we will see what will happen. Okay. Potassium is added to that uh, existing fluid. So, sir, 40 milligram, 40 millimoles, millimoles we have added. Yes, sir. 
so okay. now every one hour we have to record the potassium level the sugar level of the patient okay. and also the abg needs to be recorded okay. whether the ph is coming to 7.3 okay. if the acidosis is still maintaining and okay. also the vitals need to be checked okay. how is the saturation whether there are any signs of hypotension okay so after one hour we have checked the uh, uh, glucometer uh, sugar that is only 400 now what will you do now so we have to keep make sure that the sugar doesn't fall below 250 okay. now as it is 400 it's fine by chance if the sugar falls below 250 we have to mix the normal saline with dextrose okay. and then we have to give an infusion to the patient okay but now as it's 400 it's okay. normal okay now we got the previous counts came as uh, 15000 uh, wbc count neutrophils are very high Uh, there is a pre- recent history of infection also he in had the fever uh, recently last 3 days he is having high degree fever chills rigors okay sir is the patient complaining of any other abdominal pain had, uh, vomiting uh, diarrhea lower abdominal pain was there okay. but there are, there are no other symptoms chills rigors lower abdominal pain is there uh, what about uh, any dysuria whether there is painful urination at present it is not there at present it's not there How old is he, sir? He is only twenty-five years. So it might, it can be a urinary tract infection, okay, which is uh, causing the diabetic ketoacidosis, which okay. is a trigger for diabetes, okay. and that is what is causing hyperglycemia and making the patient seize. Okay. So uh, after after the patient is biochemically stable, okay. and after the patient is having the ability to drink food and take fluids normally, okay. we can start an antibiotic uh, therapy. What antibiotic you want to start? Uh, sir, we can give augmentin or uh, piperacillin. Augmentin, how much you want to start? Five hundred. Five hundred. Okay. So you start augmentin. We'll discuss the dose afterwards. Start augmentin. Should we give test dose for augmentin? Yes, sir. So you have to give a test, test dose, dose and uh, give augmentin injection. That will be started. Yes, okay. Now, anything else you want to check in this patient after yes. two hours? You want to check anything else? Sir, two uh, hours the. Third hour the glucose we have to monitor the continuously glucose monitor continuously the and also uh, as this patient twenty five he is only twenty five years mm. so we don't need to catheterize the patient per se but we okay. have to check whether the fluid replacement is working okay so for checking that we can also do an input output chart and okay. we can check the urine output of the patient okay last one hour is your output is good he is maintaining mm. around hundred uh, uh, ml per hour. It's uh, it was not there previously. Now it is urine is coming out. It is not uh, very clear. It's li- slightly cloudy. Mm. So that may be pointing more towards a urinary tract infection. infection. So we can send for a urine culture also. Okay. So we'll send a urine culture to check the pus cells. Can send a urine culture. Okay. So can we discuss the case now? So yes. you understood how uh, we can manage a patient who is having seizure with uh, uh, hyperglycemia. Okay. So here the hyper seizure may be actually due to the hyperglycemia itself, or it can be due to the infection, or it can be due to he is already a, a known case of seizure disorder that might have triggered due to infection. So there are three possibilities. How do you know that the, this is a existing seizure where the drug is not adequate? How do you know that? So he is on phenytoin and uh, mm. okay. The drug so levels. you have to always check the drug levels when you have an existing patient of seizure coming to emergency room with uh, uh, a breakthrough seizure. Then you have to check the levels of drug. That is a very important step because we don't know whether this seizing activity is due to the infection or hyper hyperglycemia or inadequate drug. So drug levels are the most important step to. to uh, uh, to readjust the dose of the drug okay that is the first step then uh, uh, you are given midazolam uh, that with that patient that uh, seizure activity had come come down suppose uh, you are you are not given midazolam what are the other options other than midazolam so we can give diazepam okay. su- suppository diazepam rectally okay. we can give okay. we can also give lorazepam okay. either lorazepam. you can if suppose you have uh, you have an iv line you can give lorazepam, lorazepam. or in a child you can give per rectal diazepam and midazolam nasal spray also available that also can be used the problem with uh, lorazepam is it is given in textbooks but when the patient is having active seizures it will be very difficult to put an iv in that's why here we used midazolam nasal spray luckily patients so first seizure activity is controlled but once it is controlled should we uh, you have started the first unit and should we start it or not that is the next question So all patients who is having seizure should we continue with uh, 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 phosphenetoin loading dose he is already on phenytoin should we continue it 
So if actually, there is a previous history of if he's an epileptic patient, okay. then we can continue. Actually, phenytoin. whenever we are starting phosphenetoin, phenytoin, levetiracetam, phenobarbital, all drugs, we have to give the loading dose because we don't know the history of this patient, whether the patient is taking the drug last three, four days, that also we don't know. So, when we don't know the exact history, it is better to start the patient on loading dose and uh, continue it. If the patient is taking adequate tablets and drug levels are maximum, then you can switch to another drug, not switch, you can add another drug. Okay, so you have to give the loading dose of phenytoin, phosphenytoin, levetiracetam. Okay, so all these drugs are available, but why did you choose the phosphenytoin here? So is phosphenytoin is a pro drug form of phenytoin. Okay. It is having lesser side effects, okay. and uh, this patient is having hyperglycemia. But if it was a hypoglycemic patient, okay. it is it can be given over dextrose, okay. and it's a smaller duration of time, okay. thirty minutes. So you can give faster uh, rate. You can give. That's why we always select uh, phosphenytoin. Okay. Otherwise, phenytoin is also uh, equally efficient. Uh, but the only problem is phenytoin should be given in normal saline. It should be given over forty five okay. minutes. Yes. This can be given in dextrose. This can be given in shorter period. But nowadays, the first line of treatment is levetiracetam. Levetiracetam, what is the advantage? It can be given in almost all conditions, uh, the uh, like proarrhythmic activities. Oh, yes. And it can be, be given in uh, liver disease. Mm -hmm. One of the common problem nowadays we are facing is seizure, seizing activity in a patient who is having chronic liver disease. So, there also you can use. Now, uh, you understood how we manage the seizure activity in this patient. We don't know whether the patient is having uh, like a low drug level, we don't know whether it is due to infection, we don't know because uh, it is due to hyperglycemia, all can produce seizures. Okay. Now, second part is hyperglycemia here. What is the diagnosis? Sir, as the patient is having hyperglycemia, we check the ketones, the ketones are positive, there is dehydration that is seen okay. and along with that acidosis is also there. Okay. So it is pointing towards a diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. So hyperglycemia acidosis and ketone body is positive. Mm. It, you can get diabetic ketoacidosis. Suppose hyperglycemia and acidosis, ketone bodies are negative. What are the possibilities? Sir, it can be lactic acidosis. It can be lactic acidosis. It can be respirate, uh, renal failure. Renal failure, it liver can failure. Be, uh, poisoning uh, okay, cases. Okay, anything. Okay, mm. uh, suppose he takes alcohol, alcohol toxic alcohol, also, mm. uh, also he can de develop all these things. But here ketone bodies are positive, then you can make a possibility of DK. ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis. So, how do you manage DK? You tell me three steps of management of DK. So, most important thing is first you have to correct the fluid deficit. Okay. So, we start with uh, normal saline. Okay. That is the first thing, fluid okay. replacement. Second, we have to correct the uh, potassium, potassium level. Okay. So, potassium chloride is given. Okay. And third is to correct insulin. So, we okay. give insulin. So, three important steps. One is? Fluids. Fluids. So, you may require around 6 liters of fluid in this mm. patient that over 24 hours you have to correct. First uh, few hours you have to uh, st start at least 3 liters of normal saline. Okay. Then over 24 hours uh, another th uh, 3 liters can be corrected. Okay. So, while correcting itself you can see that in actual patient you can see that sugars are coming down. Why it is coming down? So Why sugars will come down after fluids? So anyway, we are checking the gluco uh, glucometer. There is osmotic diuresis that is taking place. Not because of that. You, are, you have a concentrated mm. blood because of the hyperglycemia. Mm. When you add water to that, it dilutes. Mm. Okay. So, normally itself with only, with only your normal saline, the sugars can come down. Mm. Okay. So, there is no need to immediately start the insulin, insulin in this type of patients. You can wait. Second step is check the potassium. potassium level. Okay. Why potassium is very important? Sir, if you are planning to start insulin hmm. and the potassium is at 3, we are having a risk of having hypokalemia in the patient because insulin will pull the potassium back into the cells. Okay. So, so, to avoid that, we start potassium. Uh, translocation of potassium, potassium can occur. That can produce hypokalemia okay. and patient develops all muscle weakness, hmm. respiratory distress, all these things. So, to avoid that, you have to correct the potassium if possible or in emergency, you can along with your uh, uh, dextrose, you can add. But uh, it is not a good solution for potassium. Dextrose is not a good hmm. solution for potassium. You can give in normal saline and uh, uh, when the potassium levels are so low, like uh, 2.5 or 2, then you require a central line. Now, it is only 3, you mm -hmm. can, the deficit may be maximum 100 or 150, that initially you can correct through the peripheral line, then you can uh, easily put a central line and correct it afterwards. Okay. So, here you have added that potassium to the existing IV fluid, what you are giving uh, to this patient. That is a wrong step actually. We cannot give that much potassium so fast through a peripheral line. 
you have to put a separate line already he is having two lines so you have to select another line for that or you have to put a, a three way cannula one can, one one way you can give potassium in a slower rate other way you can give the normal saline very fast so that you have to take care okay so potassium cannot be pushed like another drug through uh, like other drugs through the peripheral lines okay that is very important so potassium is corrected then the third step is insulin insulin infusion how will you start insulin infusion uh, 0.1 units per kilogram okay per that hour. is the requirement anybody mm. any patient will have that much initial requirement so 0.1 unit for him will be 70 kg means uh, 7 seven units seven uh, initially units. infusion either you mm. can start it as an infusion or you can start it as a initial bolus then okay. infusion can be continued but after 2 hours we check the blood sugar it has dropped to 400 then how do you, how will you adjust the dose so we can give a uh, initially it was 600 we started seven units or six units initially then after 2 hours it has come down to 400 how will you check it how will you correct it the infusion protocol so you just uh, simply uh, divide it by 100 400 by 100 is 4 units that is the easiest way okay so you can give 4 units per hour infusion mm-hmm. that you have to continue how long you have to continue insulin infusion that is a most important step how long you have to continue you cannot stop the insulin infusion all of a sudden mm-hmm. so what to do Uh, sir once the patient is biochemically stable and okay. he is able to take feeds okay. we if as the patient is pre existing diabetic patient he will be taking insulin subcutaneously okay. so we ask the patient to take his insulin and okay. then 30 minutes after the subcutaneous insulin dose has been administered okay. we stop the insulin so infusion so there are some pre requests to for, for this one one is his uh, blood sugar has to come down okay second thing is abg as that high mm. anion gap metabolism high anion gap acidosis has to be Uh, reduced acidosis has to be reduced then third one is patient is able to take oral feeds all these things are there you can easily switch to uh, the subcutaneous Sub- dose but after giving subcutaneous insulin you have to uh, continue the insulin infusion another 30 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. okay so during uh, this process you are you have told that uh, at one point of time you switch to dns why should we do like that sir because if there is hypoglycemia that occurs we are giving so much of insulin hypoglycemia occurs there is a chance that the patient might have cerebral edema okay. so to avoid that and to maintain a stable glucose okay. level we need to start dns so here there are two dangers one is a patient can go to hypoglycemia if you are continuing the insulin infusion like that in a patient who is having very low blood sugar okay so normally adults will go to hypoglycemia like you told pediatric patients will go to brain edema okay so there are two dangers in adult we are afraid of uh, more about uh, hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic episodes so you switch to uh, dns okay so that ends your uh, dk management the third problem here is the infection what is the infection here so mostly a urinary tract infection so you from history from his clinical picture you you thought it is urinary tract infection so how will you select antibiotic in this condition sir as the patient is having a seizure history we will not give any quinolones we'll okay. give an oral drug okay. mostly we'll give a uh, below the diaphragm mostly it is gram negative organisms okay. so something that's having a greater action against gram negative organisms okay. we can give so we can start on uh, amoxicillin clav or okay. piperacillin so uh, the most important step here is what you told is this patient is having seizure mm. so you have to avoid a drug which can reduce the seizure uh, threshold in this patient so avoid quinolones that is important step okay whatever drug you give avoid a, patient, a drug which can produce seizure okay so that is not given either you can give uh, augmentin that is uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid that has got predominant gram positive but uh, uh, gram negative action is also there or you can go for third generation cephalosporin that is also good choice okay whatever penicillin you start they all have a little bit uh, seizure potential effect is there but uh, comparing to quinolones uh, they are uh, the, that that activity is less so here you can give either augmentin or uh, ceftriaxone then you ask for a culture report culture may take some time till then you can continue this then once you stabilize the patient so now we are giving around uh, uh, 10 uh, like 4 uh, units per hour and totally in last 24 hours you are given 100 units of insulin for example you are given 100 units of insulin in this patient last 24 hours now you have to switch this patient to subcutaneous insulin how much dose you will select that is most important thing when before you discharge the patient how how will you select that you have any idea 
So total dose is 100. Okay, 230 is enough. When you are switching to subcutaneous, after the infection is subsiding in this patient, two-third of the dose may be enough for this patient. Okay, so you may take uh, 75 units uh, for subcutaneous insulin. In that 75 units, two-third will be given in the morning or one-third will be given in the night. Okay, that uh, when you are giving long-acting insulin. Suppose you are giving short-acting insulin, 25, 25, 25. Okay, short-acting insulin should be given 25, 25, 25 before food. So, when you are switching again that to a long acting insulin, again two thirds is enough. Okay, so out from 75, you may make it again 50. That may be enough for this patient. So, 50, two thirds will be around 35 in the morning, 15 in the night. So, like that, you can switch the dose from an infusion to long short acting insulin, then to a long acting insulin. So, okay. sir, when will the patient go back to the original regime that the patient No, no, once saw? the infection is controlled, once the infection is controlled, his stress is over. So, the insulin resistance or insulin utilization, uh, resistance will reduce and utilization will be improving. So, that uh, he can go back to his original insulin. Okay. Suppose the patient's, uh, patient is on uh, analog insulin. You know what is analog insulin? What is, a, uh, what is analog insulin? What is, why, how it is different from your regular insulin? See. Regular insulins are human insulin. Mm, it is see. produced from your body or your cells or whatever it is. It is a human type of insulin. But the analog insulins are completely artificial. What is the advantage? Advantage is uh, normally when you are giving human insulin, antibodies are formed against that. Okay, so insulin after long time, antibodies will be producing against that and they it will produce resistance to that insulin. That is why we call it as insulin resistance after long period. Okay, after long period of treatment, you can see the patient will, will require higher amount of insulin. Okay, so in that type of patients, if you are giving this artificial ins insulin, which are uh, not affected by these antibodies, you can actually reduce the dose. Suppose you are giving 50 units of regular insulin, this patient may require only 30 units of analog insulin. That is the advantage. Okay, but the disadvantage is it is costly. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a disadvantage. So th can we discharge this patient now? Once the patient is stable, as ah. glucose should be normal, potassium should be normal, okay. ABG should be normal, 7.3, we okay. need a pH to be that. No, the magnesium levels are 1.6. you have any comment on that? Magnesium levels in this patient is only 1.6. This is a common problem you see in all diabetic patients. Magnesium is one electrolyte which is lost through your kidneys when you have high blood sugar. Magnesium is required for insulin to enter to inside the cell. Okay, should we correct it or not? So, we magnesium is one electrolyte. We have to check in all patients who is having diabetes which is uncontrolled because insulin action highly dependent on magnesium level. So, this patient may require magnesium also. Okay. okay. So, that also has to be corrected. Can we discharge this patient now? Fever and UTI. Fever, uh, once infection. the fever is subsiding and uh, UTI is subsiding, you can uh, discharge, uh, discharge the patient. patient. Suppose you get a urinary culture report that E. coli, E. coli is positive, more than 1 lakh colony count and it is resistance, resistant to your septriaxone. You are giving septriaxone. What do you do? But patient has improved. These are common clinical problems. Your culture report says that it is resistant, but patient has improved. Sir, we we'll look for any other, if the patient is presenting with dysuria, fever or no, anything no. bad. E. coli is positive. Your culture is uh, showing it is resistant to third generation cephalosporin. But he has improved. Should we continue it or stop it? No, eh? no sir, he has improved. So. He has improved. So, clinically he has improved. Lab wise, it is not showing sensitivity. So, we you can take the culture, we can repeat the culture. You can again. repeat the culture after some time. Mm. Or once the patient is improved with your existing uh, injection or tablet, you can still continue it because the patient is improving. Mm. No need to change it. But if the patient is not improving, ceftriaxone is resistant or ESBL is positive. What is ESBL? Extended uh, spectrum, spectrum beta, beta lactamase. lactamase. Okay. So, that bacteria has got an enzyme that can even uh, break the antibiotic. Okay, that is extended spectrum beta lactamase enzyme uh, 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 producing bacteria. In that type of bacteria, you cannot use ceftriaxone or uh, augmentin and all. You have to go for an higher drug. Imipenem. Uh, or uh, meropenem mm -hmm. or piperacillin dasabactam. So, that is the importance of ESPL. Okay, now suppose you are not getting a urine for culture. You have a previous culture reports. 
okay previous one or two culture reports that all shows e coli same e coli in the previous culture reports you can believe that culture report and shard treatment suppose the previous culture reports are different one is e coli one is klebsiella one is moraxella something like that what do you do still we will start we can start antibiotic mm. uh, the problem is in that type of culture reports the infection is from external uh, site and if the bacteria is same in all the previous culture reports there is an existing pocket of infection inside the body okay that you have to find out okay any male urinary tract infections are always problematic they are all complicated utis what is complicated uti what is a simple uti simple Ten uti means uh, in female patients you get uti no there is uh, it's it's common very very common okay so uh, there is no structural deformity there is no diabetes there is no immunocompromisation here male urinary tract infections are always complicated there may be a structural deformity there can be prostatic enlargement whatever it is there is a structural deformity or diabetes is there that has produced an immunocompromised status so that type of patients may require longer duration of treatment 14 days mm -hmm. female uti's normal female uti's require only 7, 7 days. days another problem is pregnancy okay. pregnancy with urinary tract mm -hmm. infection what antibiotic you select something that's not teratogenic we okay normally quinolones are not given okay um, but you now uh, they tell even quinolones can be tried but we don't give quinolones especially in the first trimester okay you can go for other drugs amoxicillin clavulanic acid will be the best drug mm -hmm. or you can still go for uh, ceftriaxone tell me one third generation cephalosporin cefepime cefepime cefixim sorry cefixim is a oral tablet okay cefepime is also injection okay that also can be given okay so you understood how to manage all these three conditions yes sir okay thank you thank you sir